Uh, so I think that Diane asked me here today to be provoking, uh, not in the uh, controversial sense, uh, but to provoke some thought about the forms of publishing that might best suit the work that comes out of Humanities Without Walls. Uh, and I don't want to give the impression, uh, nor does John, we were talking about this before, that we will, are demonstrating a proposed system or platform for publishing. Um, rather, we would like to encourage you to think about the system or platform that might make the most sense for the work that you're producing. And we're very happy to engage in that conversation with you. Uh, so I was uh, Associate University Librarian for Publishing with a pretty broad publishing portfolio at the University of Michigan. And as part of my remit, I was uh, to advise and support new publishing initiatives at the university, uh, which meant that in the course of my daily life, if I caught wind of a new initiative getting off the ground, which might not have any, have thought about publishing at all yet, but something like Humanities at Walls, I'd get myself invited to the director's office for coffee or ask the director out for coffee, and in the course of our conversation, when we talked about the, the program or the initiative, I'd say, so tell me about your publishing strategy. Uh, this often met with puzzled looks. And it's a publishing strategy, hum? Well, of course we want to publish, and we'll see what we can get done and see about the best place that we can, we can get it accepted to publish it. Uh, and and then we would part ways, but I was uh, pleasantly surprised by how often these conversations were followed by an email or a phone call a couple weeks later. Uh, the person would say, let's talk some more about this publishing strategy idea. What do you mean by that? Uh, and often what I would say is, how, how do you want to publish that best aligns with the goals of your program? and the goals of the authors, the scholars, who will be producing the work. Um, my, just you know, thinking about the Humanities Without Walls, the global Midwest. So you want to get global? Is that part of your goal? How are you going to do that? How are your publications going to reach a global audience? I would ask these kinds of questions. Uh, and the conversation would go on. And I would often probe on um, why uh, the people, my, my interlocutors, uh, wanted to publish. Why publish? I mean, how do you want to publish? What are you thinking about in terms of the publication methods? Um, and the answers uh, often fell into a sort of broad set of categories. There were many. Uh, but often I heard that the, they wanted to maximize the reach of their work. How can we get it out to the broadest, most diverse possible audience? Uh, there was often a question or a concern with minimizing costs. How can we do this in a sustainable and affordable way? Um, some scholars were thinking hard about how to make the most persuasive argument. Um, and that often meant thinking about uh, formats and their affordances, what best supported the argument they wanted to make. And that might mean uh, publishing on the web. Um, it might mean doing a podcast. Um, or it might mean writing, a, you know, a book. Uh, and, and we talk about that. How, how does that, how does that, will these things work to support your work? But what often came up in the course of the conversations as well was a desire to, and I would hear this, publish differently. And then it would be my turn to probe again, and I would say publish differently from, and that was usually from the well-established paths of journal articles and print monographs. Uh, and it could take a variety of forms, but they want, wanted to do something different. Um, and there were different reasons for this. Um, often it was in the interest of enriching the argument. Um, and that might mean publishing digitally in order to include uh, multimedia that print could not deliver um, in order to create a networked conversation, uh, but so, some way in which to enrich the argument. Uh, some people were interested in changing the economics of publishing. Can we publish other than publishing into the marketplace? Can we open up our work? 
Um, how can we reach audiences, a more diverse set of audiences? How can we encourage others to contribute to our work? Almost everybody wanted to share their work. Um, and often people were concerned that there wasn't necessarily a high market value placed upon their work. There wasn't an audience clamoring for the latest book on some um, fairly narrow uh, theoretical niche. Um, it was still important work to get out, but if there was not a market demanding it, were they going to have trouble placing that work for publication? So there was concern about that. And, and many of the scholars that, that, that I talked to keeping in mind these goals did not necessarily feel that the publishing business as it's currently constituted, uh, scholarly pr presses, both, scholar, both uh, uh, commercial and um, university presses, were not necessarily meeting their goals in these areas. So they wanted to think about other ways in which they might approach, approach the question of publication. And I raise this all because I, I see humanities without walls as at an emergent moment um, when it is uh, particularly opportune to consider its publishing strategy, um, that you all have an opportunity right now to be very deliberate um, about your publishing strategy um, and to innovate if that's what will, will best suit your work, uh, but rather than uh, produce something and then try to uh, catch up with the est established ways of publishing, uh, you can go into it with a conception of how this work might get published and shared. Um, and I think you're also at a moment of opportunity to take control of the publication process. Uh, there are lots of great tools out there, many of them open source and free, some not, but affordable. Uh, but there's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of tools that we can use to, um, to publish. Um, there are a lot of services, both uh, business services, Amazon.com has great publishing services if you're willing to pay the price and enter into a business relationship with them. Uh, uh, university IT departments, university libraries, a number are providing services in order to enable scholarly publishing. Um, and there are a lot of possible partners, uh, such as libraries, and I say that to make a gesture toward John, who's the university library, dean of the university library, and, and we'll talk about the ways in which a library stand ready to be partners in publishing. So with all that in mind, um, I wanna think a little bit more about Publishing, what is this publishing thing? Um, I think for most of us, I think I'm safe in saying this in a room full of humanists, uh, that publishing is a little bit mysterious and almost magical, um, where we a kind of business in which we hope to get lucky. Uh, so there's an idea and somebody turns it into a work in progress and you make contact with the publisher, and if things go well, um, at the end you have a New York Times bestseller or something, uh, but at the end the, the, there is a, a product. Um, but in fact, publishing can be broken down into a fairly well-established uh, set of functions. What do publishers do? They acquire stuff. They, they choose stuff to publish. Uh, they develop it. And uh, if uh, a good publisher will often have a good editorial development support, somebody who will look hard at your work and say, what's the best way to connect it to the audience you want? Can we help make your arguments um, stronger? Uh, how many pictures do you want to have? Uh, th these kinds of things. Uh, but develop the work, help you to develop your work. Uh, publishers also produce the work. They uh, fix it into a final, usually final, not always these days, form uh, that's delivery ready. Uh, and that might include proofreading, copy editing, uh, design, layout, uh, getting it into a uh, print ready PDF, getting it ready, getting it into um, EPUB, getting it set up to uh, be delivered on the web, uh, but they do the production aspects. 
uh, something that many of us uh, value from our publishers, I think, is they also promote and market our work. So once they've invested in the production of the work, they want to make sure that people read it. Some publishers want to make sure that people buy it. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to make sure that the audience knows about it. Uh, publishers distribute work, and that may uh, mean they put it online for anybody to read, or it may mean that they enter into business relationships with uh, printers and distributors who will help get the work into university libraries, for, for one example, or um, into online book retailers, or into uh, journal aggregation services. Uh, but in any case, publishers distribute the work. Um, and finally, publishers, uh, and they often work with their authors in this, um, they assess how well did the work do. Um, and they do this for their own business purposes um, in making future decisions about investment. Uh, what are the fields that people are interested in? What sells well? What gets a lot of attention? But they also do it for their authors, uh, to help their authors understand the impact of their work. Um, and so uh, publishers think a lot about what the metrics of assessment are, uh, whether it's sales, um, hit counts, downloads, uh, link backs. Um, and this is an increasingly, ri increasingly rich and diverse area. But these are things that publishers do. And uh, having been a publisher at several points in my life, I would say these are all pretty good and valuable things to do. Um, and I, I would not choose to ignore any of them. Uh, different, publish, different publishing models could debate that. Um, but what I would want to assert is that we should not necessarily think of them as um, arcane practices that only the highly specialized um, and highly trained can do. Uh, but what we need to do in whatever form we publish is to think about how these will be addressed. What do we have to say about how these are done? And if we choose to ignore one of them, why? What's the argument we would make for ignoring one of those? So this is a sort of basic set of things that publishers do. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to show some possible models for for publishing differently. Um, a, a few things that people have done to uh, approach publishing in a way that's outside of the way in which um, publishing is, has happened for the past few decades. Um, and in all four of these cases, taking um, advantage of the affordances of the web. Um, and to call out a few of the things that these models have done to address some of those functions. Um, so I don't, there are many, uh, models of publishing differently, new forms of publishing. These are just a few. And I'll say they're mine, because they're ones I happen to have my mitts on, um, most of them in my uh, former position at Michigan. And uh, a couple of my colleagues from Michigan are here, so they can confirm or deny. You can hunt them up afterwards and find out if I'm telling, telling you the truth. Uh, things may have changed in the past few months since I left. Uh, but these are models to which I've been close. So let me start with Open Humanities Press. So Open Humanities Press actually started out as an attempt to give a kind of good housekeeping seal of approval to open access humanities journals uh, to form an editorial collective that could say, this one's OK, um, and give some credibility to those often startup journals. Uh, but they found as soon as they started uh, that people said, OK, when are you guys going to do books? That's what we're really interested in. And in fact, in the ensuing years, and Jen, do you remember what year they started? I think it was around 2005 that they first started going. In the ensuing years, the books have far outrun the journals. Uh, they still have a bit of a journal business going, uh, but it's really about the books now. Um, it was at, uh, originally started by a group of recent um, English doctoral students at SUNY Buffalo. Um, and when I first encountered these people, and this was just coincidental, uh, my heart warmed to them because of that, because I was a doctoral student from SUNY Buffalo. Uh, but they were interested in uh, applying the principles of open access that they saw being discussed broadly in the sciences to the humanities. What would it mean to think about open access in the humanities? Um, and they were also motivated by the fact that they thought that uh, critical theory, which has always been uh, 
a popular area of study in the English Department of Buffalo, was under, underserved uh, by the scholarly publishing market. Uh, too hard to get the good stuff published, they thought. Uh, so they decided that their first issue, this is the one I really wanted to call attention to, if they wanted to start a, bre a, a press, how were they going to establish the credibility of that press without an established imprint? And they decided to do that by collecting what I think is a very strong editorial board. I'll just call your attention to it on the left. I know, it, I know it's very um, faint, uh, a few names, uh, Elaine Bourdieu, uh, uh, Jonathan Culler, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, uh, Gary Hall, Donna Haraway, uh, and, and it goes on, there, there's quite a few. But they had a very strong and sympathetic editorial board who were also very interested in the idea of opening up the humanities, and who were willing to review and to approve proposals, um, and in many cases also willing to serve as series editors. Uh, and they organized their imprint around these series. I'll just pull up the books page here. So you can see those on the left. So um, each series edited by a senior scholar or two, um, and then, and each of those series will have several books within it. Um, and it's been going swimmingly, I would say. Uh, pull this up. So all of these books are free to read and download online. I think all of them are published with Creative Commons licenses, but in any case, liberal terms of use and reuse. Um, they're also uh, for sale uh, in, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have any. I left them on my hotel bed. I had a few to pass around. Um, it, they're for sale in what I think are quite um, handsome art, um, artifactual volumes. Uh, they're paperbacks, reasonably priced, uh, uh, nice covers. Uh, well-designed, um, and these are produced through organized volunteer labor. Uh, some people are doing it purely for the love of it. Um, others are doing it as a small part of their faculty appointment at their various institutions. Uh, it's spread across the globe at this point. Uh, the director of the Open Humanities Press now has a faculty appointment in Australia, uh, and uh, as does uh, a person who volunteers his time to do the layout for the print volumes. Uh, the online versions are um, hosted by Michigan Publishing, and Michigan Publishing also brokers the business deal so that there can be print versions. Um, and so these can be bought in print and uh, are a pleasure to read. So as I said, I was particularly interested in how they tackled the question of credibility and here's another somewhat similar and somewhat different model called Digital Culture Books. Uh, digital Culture Books was originated as a joint imprint of the University of Michigan Press and the University of Michigan Library, which later became a merged organization. Uh, so now Michigan Publishing encompasses both um, the publishing activities of the library and the University of Michigan Press. Uh, but at the time, the press had decided it was time to get its digital feet wet, and they wanted to think about how to do that, so they decided to start a dedicated series that would always be free to read online, available for purchase. Um, each project book went through the full press review and editorial development process, but also has a digital life. Um, there's just a few titles here. There's several of them now. And the, in the di digital life, and I think every case, I guess my colleagues from Michigan this, but I think in every case, um, the online life is an enriched version of the print. Um, often much, much more um, uh, uh, illustrated, literally illustrated, kind of quality of illustration that would simply not be possible in print without being unaffordable. Um, so this is one recent title. Um, where's the online version? Well, you can see, buy this book, read for free online. And uh, 
uh, several years in, and again, I think this is about 10 years in now, since we conceived of the idea, although it took a while to get the first books to print, or to, to print to screen. Um, so several years in, it's, it's doing quite well. And when we started it, uh, there was concern, and particularly I would say among the staff at the press who had not tried this experiment before, we're gonna give these things away for free so who's going to buy them? How do we make our money back? And whereas I cannot claim, I'm not close enough to the, to the economics anymore to say that they have made, that they're fully a cost uh, recovery operation, I would say that the print versions of these books have not sold any worse than, sales, than the sales forecast if they, there had only been print and no free online version. Um, and not appreciably worse, and in some cases quite a bit better than standard print scholarly monographs. Uh, there's some indication that the online availability may be spurring the purchase of print. So people read for a while online, say, this is good, I like this, but maybe I want a book. Uh, so there's no clear indication that, the, um, that, uh, free, print of it, that free online availability hurts print sales, and, and maybe the opposite. So those are two book models. Let me show a couple of other forms, and then John will tell us about whether we can reinvent the book. Here this go. There we go. Uh, this is another product of Michigan Publishing, um, the Influenza Encyclopedia of the American in Influenza Epidemic of 1918 through 1919. Uh, I really enjoyed this project, and. Uh, my staff were quite enthusiastic about working on it because they said, hey, it's a project where we might save some lives. Uh, that may be a bit grand, but, but the intention of this project, um, some scholars in the Center for History and Medicine wanted to uh, do a social history of cities in the influenza epidemic of 18, 1918 to 1919. Um, and they were particularly interested in what they called escape communities communities where very few, if any, people were struck by the flu. And they, what they wanted to do was by studying diaries, letters, newspapers, uh, see if they could identify patterns. Okay, the, school, the towns that got away easy all closed their schools before anybody got sick. Or quarantine had to happen within six hours. Or I can't remember what the examples were, but this kind of thing. They were looking for these patterns. Uh, but in order to do this, they sent out a small army of graduate students into archives and museums to locate and scan the documents uh, that would support their research. And once they had done that, they said, well, other people might like to see these too and maybe could do even more interesting research with them. Maybe we could put them online. Um, and then they always had in mind the ultimate product, which was the encyclopedia, where there would be um, what they called biographies of each city uh, with links to the documents to support the contentions that they were making and to, to, dem to serve as evidence to, to demonstrate. Uh, so they had done this, but they really weren't sure how to, how to go about it. Uh, so they contacted us in the library, and we helped them to both design the website and publish the text and get it online. And last I knew, and I have not touched base with these folks lately, they were also interested in a print publication for the encyclopedia. And um, I know they had interested publishers. I'm not sure if it's gone forward. Uh, but we also helped them to create a very rich database of the documents. So there's one, I'm not too far off. Um, and you can also uh, search within the documents to find things that are of particular interest to you. So, uh, take another quick look at the image. But this is a way of, uh, both creating a publication out of the supporting evidence and um, sharing the evidence, uh, giving it a broader audience. 
So you can see there are other galleries for other cities. And I wanted to show one journal example too. Um, this, oops, come back. Ah, I misplaced my hyphen, but it's the Trans-Asian Photography Review. Um, so this is a journal, as you would expect, by, uh, uh, produced by a group of American scholars who are interested in Asian photography. Uh, and from the moment they started, they knew they wanted to be online, and they knew that they wanted it to be an open access publication. As you might expect, they're very interested in reaching Asian audiences, and they're also interested in soliciting contributions from Asian photographers and Asian scholars. Um, and because of that, uh, the, the, they were driven to online publication. Um, and they also wanted to take advantage of the illustrative uh, affordances of the web. Uh, one of the things that they want to do and that they seek funding for, and with some success, is to be able to translate work on, on Asian photography uh, for an American audience. Uh, and this has been particularly interesting to me. Um, they have what they call curatorial projects, which are reviewed just the way a journal article would be reviewed, but which is a chance for um, a scholar to put together a set of photographs and to comment upon them and have them published in a kind of, uh, in an established journal. Uh, so here is a, article on photography and humor, and here's the explanatory text, and then it's a curated set of images. And if my connection responds, uh, not only can you look at the image, but you can manipulate it in various ways. Uh, you can pan and zoom, you can enlarge it uh, to different resolutions, but do the kinds of things that you would want to do with photography. Uh, so this is, again, taking advantage of what the web can do. Uh, so here you see some information about the, uh, about the image, but it looks like it, it will be too slow to do. Uh, take advantage of what the web can do, but also bringing to bear um, well-established scholarly values of review um, on a, and of a serial publication, creating it in the familiar framework of a journal. Um, so those are just a few possible models. Some of them may resonate with your work. Uh, some of them may not. Uh, here we are. So I just uh, we can move it about. See what else is there. Um, but I hope they at least spur some thoughts about what you may do with your work or, or some questions about what form would best, would best suit your work. Um, I'll anticipate one question, and then I want to turn this over to John. Um, as many people have thought about publishing differently, and we addressed this a little bit when I talked about humani um, the Open Humanities Press, um, people are concerned about the professional and institutional acknowledgement of achievement and impact in some of these new forms of publishing. Um, and that's real and very much, I think, under in conversation these days. Uh, but I would say that what it um, creates is a demand upon all of us as we think about our publishing models uh, to investigate with ourselves and with, and with our publishing partners and with our fellow scholars, how do we define and collect the metrics that we need to understand the impact of our work? Um, how can we be clear about our editorial principles in a way that confer, con, conveys the credibility of the work? And how do we engage the academy in the discussion of the value of the work? How do we get the Academy to think together about, okay, so it's not in a form we're familiar with. It's kind of interesting. What's the value? How do we measure it? How do we talk about it? So I want to uh, turn this over to my partner in crime here, uh, but I just want to close by saying that I, um, 
invite you and, and hope that you will be self-conscious in your publishing strategy. Um, and I certainly stand by to help in any way that I can. And either I, I'd be happy to hear from you individually, and Diane knows how to find me, um, and have, I hope to have further conversations with you in the future. Thank you. So I'd like to bring it back around to uh, Maria's point about uh, goals and purposes in this, but ultimately uh, uh, by taking you through a small journey about, about how, how we get to where we are right now. And some of the things that we're talking about that influence our conversations today, um, I think many of you know about or have heard about uh, um, the uh, AAU ARL proposal for subventions for first books in the humanities. And this is something that came out of a couple of years of discussions because of some concern about the sustainability of scholarly books and university presses and the way that we see uh, this, this collapsing, this, uh, this, this uh, mechanism for, for our work and fewer first books being published or being able to be published because of the marketplace. And Mellon's interest, and many of our institutions got visits from Mellon, curious to talk to scholars about, about the same problem or related problems, and interested in trying to find ways to, to affect the economics of what's going on um, because, but th because things are, are not going well. And I, I'd like to bring a sharper focus to that point in just a, just a moment. But a lot of this is about, um, about challenge, challenges to books, scholarly books, particularly in a marketplace. And I want to start by um, emphasizing a couple of things here. Um, one is that the costs remain high. And we've done a lot in our world to try to remove um, unnecessary costs from the system. There are still problems with books being stored in warehouses and the prices we pay for that, and books not being sold and, I think, unfortunately pulped. Um, and inefficient workflows, but by and large, the costs are down to some small margins, and most of the costs are in the people who uh, are in our presses and make all of this work. And sometimes I think that those, those costs are, are, are unfortunate because they don't align with what we're trying to do, and, and again, this point about purposes and, and goals. So uh, at, at Michigan, we had three people in in marketing, in generally in marketing in ways that were not aligned with the way that uh, uh, books got noticed and got used. Three people in finance to manage a declining set of revenues um, it got harder and harder as the revenues got smaller um, and, and the, the, the distribution process got, uh, got, got, uh, got more difficult. Um, rights management, uh, rights management that's often about the, the rights for scholars to use the materials and I think this is an unfortunate piece of the, of the business, but it's about the people involved. So those margins are very hard to reduce even further. Costs remain high, despite a lot of pressure on trying to reduce costs. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, um, revenues declining. Well, actually, I'll talk about it a little bit more than briefly. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the, the big problems here. And I'm going to uh, put, some, put some numbers to this in, in just a moment. But uh, the, 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 uh, the revenues continue to decline in a world where, uh, where the, 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 the means by which we produce the books depend uh, to, uh, overwhelmingly on these, on these revenues. There's been a fair amount of finger pointing about libraries discontinuing or ceasing to buy scholarly books. Um, some research that will be out soon from uh, Paul Courant uh, Librarian, economist, uh, economist, and then librarian, Elizabeth Jones, uh, uh, researcher at uh, at Washington, um, showing uh, a fairly flat uh, library uh, sales record uh, over the last couple of uh, decades. Um, one thing is very clear: uh, that is the, that uh, we as individuals are buying fewer books, and the bottom has fallen out in terms of popular sales of materials. And this is a big difficult part of the, uh, of the equation when so much relies on those sales. And I'll, I'll uh, give, give a little bit more attention to that in just a moment. So, um, so uh, things are bad, and we've talked about them being bad for a while. But I want to um, uh, talk about how, how really bad they are. These are uh, numbers from uh, uh, AAUP, uh, the American Association of University Presses, um, uh, annual report uh, analysis, financial analysis at the end of 
of, uh, of fiscal year 14, where, where the numbers are pretty overwhelming. Uh, two thirds of university presses um, running deficits. Um, these, uh, this uh, nomenclature, group one, group two, group three, group four, is about essentially size of presses. Uh, group one is the smallest presses, group four are the largest uh, presses. And you can see in just about every one of these categories, uh, the, the presses are, are losing money and really losing money in, uh, we are essentially, in, in, a, in a false economy where, uh, where many of the costs are being subsidized and are not reflected in this. So, so losing money over uh, a $600,000 subsidy at one institution or over um, uh, the majority of the, the staff being funded on state funds and not being calculated in these costs. So, so even worse than, than that uh, uh, appears uh, is the case. And, and I found this a little bit uh, interesting here, and it points to um, uh, a thing those of us in the business know well. Um, group four, the large presses, uh, the performance, uh, the, the good performance uh, is accounted for by, um, by uh, 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 discernible and disproportionate influence um, of one press. And this is almost certainly uh, Thomas Piketty's book. We're, we're always looking for that, that book, right? The, the one that will save us. A river runs through it. Uh, uh, Piketty's book, uh, the uh, Chicago Manual of Style, something that will uh, save the business. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's a lot to bank on. Well, you know, maybe, maybe this was just a bad year. No, uh, this was, you know, last year was even worse. Uh, uh, and, and if we look back at the data over the years, it's been a pretty dismal picture for, for, for a very long time. And I think the, the, the point here, the, the thing I want to emphasize is, is this uh, marketplace piece of, of, uh, of publishing and the tie to the marketplace. I don't want this to be uh, sound like or be an attack on publishers or publishing. This is part of our world and we need to make it work. Um, but really rather an attempt to understand what's happening. Uh, what is happening, I think by defining scholarly book publishing in a marketplace to sustain it, many books that we need to have published don't get published. Uh, the vast majority of published books uh, don't reach the wi widest possible uh, relevant audience and uh, the books that do get published are not easily used in a way that's consistent with the needs of a digitally inflected uh, uh, academic practice. So we want to use the books in our practice and they're not digitally available or if they are digitally available there are constraints on the way that we can use it so there should be a, a better flow of information in all of this. Um, I mentioned cost earlier. Uh, in the press world we talk about the cost of producing a book and in internal conversations and in conversations with Mellon and AAUP. One of the numbers that gets floated a lot is $25,000. So uh, after all those subsidies and the, the pieces of what I call the false economy, um, a lot of us talk about $25,000 as the cost of uh, producing the book. You think about what happens in the sales of, of a scholarly book, um, the cut that Amazon takes or other book distributors, jobbers as they're called, um, take. Um, if the book is $30, and if we're talking about a paperback book, $30, uh, with all those, all those cuts being taken, the book needs to sell 1,500 copies just to break even at that $25,000 uh, rate. And, and I think we, I, I hope, hope we all know that that is a rare book in our world. And so we're, we're looking at a, a, a marketplace that we're asking to sustain something that's critical to what we do and it's fundamentally impossible in that way if we ask the marketplaces to sustain it. So what I want to bring this around to is, um, is a response, uh, is the beginning of a discussion about a response uh, to this. And I want to focus on a few things here. Um, one is to uh, advocate for abandoning the reliance on the marketplace. Um, we want to ensure that the book can be read by, by as many people as possible and sell only that which can be consumed. So in Maria's example earlier of the Open Humanities Press or digital culture books, all those books are online free for everybody with a Creative Commons license. Um, you can buy a copy of it in print and that may be handy for you. It is for me, um, uh, for, for, for many books. Um, but we're only selling the consumable version. Uh, maybe it's a Kindle version. Maybe it's something that's tied to uh, an apparatus that allows us to use it. 
but the book is available freely to everybody. And I think we need to stop selling access. And that's a piece I want to emphasize here. So we're cutting out large portions of the marketplace of people who, marketplace, those of us who would use the materials um, by constraining it. I want to give you a specific example that is, um, uh, I hope will sound counterintuitive to you, but in one moment of desperation at one press, in order to increase margins to help shore up the bottom line, um, we'll, uh, over a period of time, a couple of years, the press moved to hardcover only at about $100 a copy. That meant that there were better margins on the books being sold, which helped the press's bottom line for a short period of time. But what it did was starve off offer, out readership. Fewer people were reading it. You would not assign that book in your course. Fewer people were buying the book. And so the book lacked oxygen. It wasn't getting to uh, as many people as possible. And we're cutting off the flow of discourse by doing that kind of thing. But it is the marketplace that's driving it. Um, and here, this is my you know, li librarian's pitch here, protect the scholarly record. As we move into a world where we're licensing information, it's locked up for the term of the license, which can be forever. And we don't have a way, for example, with the doctrine of first sale, to ensure that we can preserve that content in a way that people will see it in the future. So moving to a more open model where we can preserve the content and we're only selling consumables ensures that we uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, preserve, protect the scholarly record. So the second piece I want to emphasize here is, is going back to Maria's point about purposes, goals. We want to seize the technology uh, to expedite and refine. So flexibility. Um, a book, uh, uh, there are constraints in what we can put in print. Uh, too small is difficult. Too large is difficult. Um, we'll have books that come out that are very large where uh, uh, we as publishers will say, yeah, you know, we can't really support uh, all of that apparatus for the book. It needs to be out of the book for us to be able to sell it. It's going to cost us too much to produce that book in a way that is meaningful for scholars. And that should, again, seem counterintuitive to you. Um, but with uh, digital technologies, we can be flexible about that. We can print that which needs to be in print. We can leave online uh, surrounding apparatus. So flexibility is one of the points here. Speed, um, I, I bet everybody in the room has a, has a, has a personal experience. It's about a process that was way too slow for them um, because a lot of the marketplace is tied to things that are cyclical, seasonal, uh, opportunities that come only at certain times of the year, uh, workflows that uh, have bottlenecks. And so we reduce speed by relying on on those things, I think we have opportunities to increase speed. Feedback, um, uh, we have wonderful opportunities for feedback. I think one of the great uh, examples in this, in this space is, uh, is Kathleen's, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick's uh, book, um, Draw a Blank on the Name and Planned Obsolescence, where she wrote the book online. The book hit print, but she got a lot of feedback as she was writing the book. We have those opportunities. And, Feedback is, an, I think, an important mechanism here. Um, often we want the feedback beforehand. I know we have at, at least one person here who's on a press's editorial board and knows how, how costly and painful and long that feedback process is to get a book into print. Why don't we do it as the book is being produced and increase the feedback? And then innovation. I think we're very fortunate in this world to have things like uh, Tara McPherson uh, and, uh, and Scalar uh, as one mechanism for, uh, for uh, uh, and USC, uh, for, for innovation, but different ways of doing things that uh, can be embedded in our world to help sustain uh, uh, scholarly communication and uh, which we can then move forward. But, but I also want to say, and I think to, to really emphasize that, that uh, for many of us, the uh, uh, structured discourse, uh, a, a logical, linear, structured um, argument is very important, too. And it's not all about innovation. Um, we can do wonderful things online with uh, structured text uh, and, uh, and put that into print, too. So um, there are lots of great things out there. The uh, Public Knowledge Project's Open Monograph Press uh, software, which is available freely. Um, the work that Michigan's doing in uh, 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 structured text. Uh, a uh, number of other things, XTF, uh, for example. 
Um, so uh, so there, there are great tools already in existence. I, I would say over and over again, this is not a technological problem. This is a social problem. This is about re-engineering us and the way that we do things. So I want to you know, go back to this $25,000 book thing and say it's time to abandon the $25,000 book because it's problematic. And I don't want to say it's time to abandon the $25,000 book and we should be cheap. We should be cheap, actually. We should be cheaper than we, we ha actually have been in the past. And I think we should cut some, some corners. But, but I think it's important to recognize that there are costs in the system. And the point that I would like to make here is that not only should we be cheaper and only do what is absolutely necessary, but we should embed costs in existing structures. And that's the point I want to I wanna leave with. Um, uh, w what do we do then uh, here? Well, I think we do need to embed costs in existing structures. And I'd like to make some points about the existing structures. Maria's example, the, the, the uh, uh, what do publishers do, um, acquisition and development. This is what we do as scholars. Um, it's, I think, more appropriate to do things in the Humanities at Without Walls process than to build an editorial staff that sits separately and is supported by a marketplace that's failing it. We do this in our departments. We do this in our joint initiatives. Scholarship is all about acquisition and development. Um, production support. Libraries have immense systems for production support and should be turning that attention to supporting these resources instead of saying, you know, when it's done, when it's over with, let's take that and preserve it. No, build the production systems that will support the, the ongoing record around supporting that, that record as it's being developed. Um, ditto for, for preparation for things like, uh, uh, things like uh, uh, copy editing. Um, these are things that we can build into our existing structures, uh, uh, small costs on top of it. I would never argue uh, for doing away with copy editing. It's an important part of, of what we do. Um, uh, design. Uh, design has been uh, uh, a fetishized piece of uh, what happens in the university press world. I would argue that it is, it is all about usability. That is what we must be ensuring here, usability of the object. And, um, and that's about the material that's there. And usability is going to be different depending on what the argument is. And we should give attention to usability rather than design per se about what we're trying to produce and how we make that available. There are mechanisms in our world for doing that, that kind of work uh, increasingly. Uh, marketing is about discoverability. Um, libraries are, don't do enough with uh, discoverability, but, but they're doing more and more, turning their attention to discoverability. And that's something that we can expect libraries to take responsibility for. We should expect them to take responsibility for it. So again, there are costs in the system, um, but to make the publishing process hostage to the market, I think, is the fundamental mistake. We should move away from that and find a way to support these things in the things that we do. So it's not, it's not a radical new model. It's about embedding that model in the things we do, embracing it as part of what we do as, as academics, and finding ways to support the, uh, the fundamental pieces of, of the, uh, of the uh, publishing enterprise. Um, that's what we're going to set out to do. Um, one of the things that I um, am excited about is that, that there is another piece in all of this, and that is, uh, that is research. Um, uh, Maria talked about access and trying to understand what's being done with access. And, and uh, uh, iSchools are uh, formerly library schools. We have, how many faculty from iSchools do we have here? I know we have one, Paul, others? Um, Stephen Downey was here earlier, but, but there's a really fabulous research opportunity here in understanding the way that people use materials, what will help ensure that they have access and that they're being used in an appropriate way. So there's, there's also that research piece and there is another, there's also a home for that too. So that's where I wanted to bring it. That's, uh, thank you.